Beth Livingston. Beth is a WordPress coach and designer. She owns WP Roadmaps and Coaching, providing project and productivity management education to WordPress consultants and agencies. Beth also administers the WordPress Project Management Facebook group and serves as an organizer for the Triad WordPress Meetup group. Is that, that sounds dangerous. It's the Triad, it's Winston, Salem, Greensboro, and High Point, North right. Carolina. <laughs> uh, where she has hosted several happiness bar events for those needing help. Put your hands together, Beth Livingston. Hi everybody, I'm really happy to be here. Don't, don't you just love WordCamp? It's like, it's like summer camp for geeks. I love it. Um, so I, I love being here. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about how to leverage your project management methodology to set yourself above and apart from your competition. First let me give you a little bit more detail about who I am now. Full disclosure. <laughs> That was a professional headshot I had done in 2006, 2006 when I did a little theater work. And I'll tell you another little thing about theater. It's when you get up on the stage and you're pretending to be somebody else, very easy, no nerves. But when you're up here being yourself in front of all your peers, it's somewhat, um, my mouth is dry, so that's why I have this lozenge in the side of my mouth here. I apologize for that. Um, so I have a master's degree in education, and when I got out of uh, graduate school, I keep forgetting there's a screen up here, I can see. Um, when I got out of graduate school, I started as um, an instructional designer, and then that morphed into working for, um, as a business analyst in IT for 20 some odd years. And that's where I really cut my teeth on project management. I worked for some really brilliant men who actually were much more visionary than even they realized at the time. And I'll tell you a little bit about that in just a second. Then in 2009, I started building a web app for, you know, that was when the couponing craze was the whole big deal, right? And so, um, but I hate couponing. So I wanted to create a system where you could save money on groceries. Just show me where my stuff is on sale, right? So I built this web app, and I was trying to build it, and I had this friend helping me who was a .NET programmer, and then he got a girlfriend. And so <laughs> he was never available when I needed him to be available. So I said, come on, Chris, there's got to be an easier way. I'm highly technical. You need to give me some, some tool I can work with. So he sent me Joomla. <laughs> I didn't get that. Um, but then I discovered WordPress, and that's when I started using that to do my own websites, and then I started working, doing that for other people. I left the corporate world in 2016 and decided I was going to build these roadmaps, these training roadmaps for um, WordPress people, right? Like how to do a membership site, front to back, top to bottom, everything you need to do a membership site, or everything you need to do an e-commerce site. Well. Do any of you know Adam Prizer? <laughs> WP Crafter? Anybody know WP Crafter? Woo! Well, there was no need in me trying to, com to compete with the man. He, can, he creates 20 videos a day, and he does exactly that. So he was doing these roadmaps for people, you know, complete solutions. So that kind of threw that idea out of the window. And then, and that's how you changed how, what my business is like. I told you I would tell you that today. <laughs> But, um, and if anybody has new people that need training, his Facebook group and his YouTube channel can really get people to the finish line a lot faster. He's really good. Sometimes I have to put him on fast speed because he talks kind of slow. But, um, <laughs> but his stuff is really good. And he also keeps abreast of all the stuff that's happening in the, in the in, you know, like this plugin is having a, security issue or whatever. He keeps up with all that and keeps everybody informed. I, I, I'm in his Facebook group too. Okay, enough about him. Um, <laughs> so I, just, I, I started going to word camps and I started hanging out with uh, you know, our peeps and I kept hearing people complaining about the same things. Scope creep, getting content from the clients, getting the projects done on time and within budget and still having a happy client. Um, and these are things that I learned how to do in corporate IT. And I, so I've got the magic sauce for all that. So I thought, well, why don't I put that together and start sharing it with people? Um, so that's part, well, when I first launched WP Roadmaps and Coaching, it was about doing what Adam's doing. But now it's about uh, real life project management skills for you guys. Because what I'm finding is, and it's nobody's fault, it's just that 
um, you know, you, these small agencies are forming, and you've got this great programmer and a, and a talented designer, and um, they even know they even have really good business skills, but they nobody ever taught them how to manage projects, and it, it's a skill. It's a, like a whole discipline. So you need to kind of. It, it's not something you can. Most people can't really be successful at it. Just I'll figure it out. It, it, there are some tips and tricks to make this stuff work. Okay, so what I'm going to tell you about today is the importance of a project management methodology, the key elements of a project management methodology, and how to craft those key elements, and then how to use your project management methodology as a unique value proposition when you're competing against other people. Now, here's the very most important thing if you want to leverage your project management methodology. The very first thing is that you must actually have one. <laughs> okay, so how many people in here have a written project management methodology or development methodology that you follow? See? About maybe one third of the, of the people in the room. Um, what a project management methodology is, is a set of guiding <coughs> principles and processes that defines how you work and communicate. And it's important for your client to know that up front. And you need to know what it is. If it's not written down and you haven't discussed it with your team, or maybe it's just you, you still need to have this. Um, now, let's make a distinction here, though. Wait, now, let me tell you why you need it first. Random processes are going to always result in project overruns, which what, what does that do? Your ROI eats it up. But if you have repeatable processes that increases your efficiency, it allows you to do more precise estimating. You get better over time. You have a better informed client. You, the, there's a clearer understanding by everyone, the client, you, and the team, um, of the tasks ahead. You end up with higher quality clients because you can shop for clients instead of letting them shop for you. And then sets you apart from the competition. And that's what we're going to really focus on. But I want to give you some background first. Because you want to be like this woman. Does anybody know who this is? Right. Does anybody know what show that's from? Very good. Do you know why Rita Marino is so revered and, and feared at auditions? She's a triple threat. She can sing, she can act, and she can dance. Okay? So you want to be a WordPress triple threat. You may be a great designer of websites. You may be a builder, developer, implementer of WordPress websites. I'm never sure what to call that. You know. If you don't write code, you can't really be a developer, but I'm developing websites. So anyway, I'm calling everyone WordPress practitioners. That sort of covers it, right? OK. Um, and then the last thing is being a manager of website projects. This makes you a triple threat and much more marketable when you can prove to your client, hey, I know a lot more than that next guy does <laughs> about getting these things done on time. But I want to make a quick distinction here because Adam's not in here. Adam Silver? No. I listened to one of his podcasts the other day, and he was talking about project management methodologies and how he's trying to choose the one that was right for him. And he did some research. But what I noticed about his podcast, and I did tell him this in person. I would not just say this without talking to him first, is that he was calling all of these things project management methodologies, and they're not. If anybody's out of corporate IT or any kind of um, formalized IT, you probably have heard of Waterfall. Waterfall software development life cycle. Okay, that's a development methodology. Project, project management methodology, as I said before, is a set of guiding principles and processes that define how you work and communicate. And here's some examples. PMI, has anybody ever heard of this institute, the Project Management Institute? And they have a book called the PMBOK, which is the Project Manager's Book of Knowledge. Um, they're a pure project management methodology. So is Six Sigma and SEI CMM which is the Software Engineering Institute's Capability Maturity Model. <laughs> those, things, those are all um, project management methodologies. But a development methodology is a life cycle for developing or maintaining a product, application, or service. So it's a little different. And some examples of that are Waterfall, RAD, which is Rapid Application Development, and then Application Maintenance, just some examples. But then there's, the com con the, there's these methodologies that have combined the two, and the most popular being uh, well, these are where they're combined. Most popular being Agile. If those of you who have ever worked in a formal environment, then you've heard of this. Um, and Kanban and Scrum are both versions of Agile. They're not different. They're different, but they're, 
people are referring to these as three different things, and they're not because Kanban and Scrum are versions of Agile, just so you can all be educated about that. <laughs> now, back in the day when I worked for Keen, which was a big software consulting firm based in Boston, uh, John Keen, he was an old IBMer, and he uh, formed this consulting firm, and the projects kept running over time and over budget, so he did what any IBMer would do, and he hired a consultant <laughs> to come in and study that. And out of that study came, these are where the bottlenecks are, these are where the problems are. And he came up with the six principles for productivity management for software development. I've taken those same six principles and modified them somewhat for WordPress. So I'm just going to go over these quickly, and then we'll get to the meat of what we're talking about. Um, John Keane talked about defining the job in detail, but what I've done is changed it to define the job in detail with a content first approach. How many were just in Jennifer's talk? Okay, so I have a different viewpoint of content first than Jennifer does, so I'm just going to worry about that right up front. Um, I do wait until I have all the content before I begin the work, and because I structure the payment schedule so that I make sure I get paid for that detailed discovery. That, that's a whole other topic for another day, but um, the content first thing works for me, but she is right that you have to judge that based on the size of your client, the technical expertise of your client. You have to, um, nobody can give you a, a, a road map that is perfect for everything you do. You got to take that stuff and then modify it for the specifics of your client and your niche or whatever. The second thing is get the right resources involved. John Keane was get the right people involved, but we know there's a lot more resources to get involved like plugins and blocks and um, themes and things like that. Estimate the time and cost, but here it's estimate the time and cost often because <coughs> estimating is not just a one-time task. It's something you need to do across the project. Break the job down. This is where John Keane was so, um, few, uh, what's the word? Uh, he, he was very forward-looking. He, he defined something uh, about Agile before they even knew about Agile, and that was the 80-hour rule. He had us have a deliverable every 80 hours. Now, that might be a little overkill for a WordPress project, but the point is break it down into chunks, and you have a deliverable every so often, so you always know exactly where you are in the... It holds everybody accountable, and you know exactly where you are in the project timeline. Now, everybody, and this next to the last one, establish and stick to a change procedure. Just about everybody's got a change procedure. The problem is we don't stick to it. <laughs> A lot of people, you know, I'll just throw that in. You know, it's going to take too long to go through the change procedure. I'll just do, no. Uh -huh. That's what that's about. Oops, wait, let me go back. Then get the last one. Establish interim and final acceptance criteria. A lot of people say, when the site is live, we are done. That is not enough of acceptance criteria for your client to sign off. You've got to have a lot more detail. So that's, that was what that principle was about. And doing it for the interim deliverables as well. So there's never a question, has anybody ever had this happen where you, you know you've done exactly what you all agreed to and you hand it to them and they go, oh wait, that's not what I asked for. <laughs> but it's not written down what those checkoff items are. <coughs> well, if it meets these criteria, you're not allowed to say, I don't, want, I don't like it. Because you already agreed that that's what was going to happen. And when you do that up front, it really does save a lot of problems with scope creep and things like that. Okay, now onto the elements of a good project management methodology. Well, the first thing it does is it defines how you estimate the project. You need to share that with the client. How do you, how did you come up with this estimate? Um, and I'll tell you a minute about the crystal ball approach and why that does not work. <laughs> but um, that, that needs to be a part of your project management methodology. Proper and good estimating and have it documented how you do that. Oh, then let me go up on my soapbox for one second. Stop calling it a quote. A quote is when the man comes to build a fence in your yard and he can measure the front. He knows exactly what the materials are going to be. He knows exactly how long it's going to take him and he knows exactly how big it is. But unless you're doing a detailed discovery in that first meeting with the client, that's just not true. There's no way you can, so it's an estimate until you get the detail and then you can give a more precise estimate. And, oh, and there's also no such thing as an accurate estimate. You see why? Because an estimate is an estimate, so it can't be accurate. Okay. <laughs> Um, and the next thing that you need to have in your project management methodology is how you're going to manage the resources. How do I know that you're getting the right people involved? How do I know that you're getting the right plugins involved? How do I know that you're using the proper theme? You need to have uh, a method by which you determine those things. And you need to have that written down. You need a work breakdown structure for your standard way you do business. It only takes one time of doing this and then you can reuse it over and over and over. Um, and so does everybody know what I mean by work breakdown structure? 
activities, uh, phases, activities, tasks. Because you need that in order to estimate properly. A lot of times we just kind of take a grab out of the air, but that never works. Um, you need an approach to content collection. Are you going to use a content first approach? Are you going to do sprints where the content is the deliverable at the end of that sprint or 80 hour rule or 120 hour rule or whatever you decide to use? So you need, but you need to have that documented. And what's going to happen when the client doesn't deliver the content? Are you going to keep working? Here's what usually happens. Well, they missed their deadline. I'm just going to go ahead and finish the website. Then when they get the content finished, I'll just plug that in. Mm -hmm. Then they never get the content done. And you've done all this work for free because you only got that little deposit at the beginning. So that's why that old way of doing things doesn't work. And I've got a lot of stuff on my website I'll share with you in a minute um, where you can get some more in information on this. But um, I have a content collection process that works because of the way I also structure the payment schedule. And then change management, of course, you've got to have a really good change management plan and acceptance management. So there's six sections that you really must have in a good project management methodology. Proper estimating resource management, work breakdown structure, approach to content collection, a change management procedure, and acceptance management plan. Any questions? Okay, so let's dig a little bit deeper into those things. Proper estimating. I think that's going to take us about 10 hours, but you know, just be safe, we'll put down 12. That is the crystal ball approach and it never works. Especially because if you're doing this estimate and trying to come up with a precise estimate in your proposal, you're most likely not going to hit the mark because there's no way after an hour and a half discovery meeting you can, I use a, I use a range in the proposal, then I do a more detailed statement of work, then I get a deposit that covers me creating the statement of work, then we do a, a deep dive and a much more detailed statement of work. I always give the client the option to back out at that point, if the, if the next quote, excuse me, estimate comes in too high, um, higher than that, that range, then I give them a chance to back out. But I just hand them the statement of work. They already paid for it, and I walk away. That way, everybody's happy at the end of that, right? It's not any argument or anything. So this is why you should need to abandon the crystal ball approach. Don't try and estimate what you don't know. So this needs to be part of your estimating process. If you can convince a client that you don't estimate what you don't know, and that's why we have to do this deep dive first, so that I can find out everything, make sure that I've got you a proper estimate, they usually respect that. You want to get rid of the pad as your method of change control. And let me tell you why. Um, you can't measure it. All right? If I, if I say this project's going to cost $5,000, and then you know me and Johnny decide, well, let's put 20% on top of that just in case we have problems. Well, that might happen, and you might eat, that, eat up that whole amount that you added on top, and you still come out okay, but you don't know which places you messed up or which places the client didn't give you what they needed. There's no way to have the lessons learned from that because it's an arbitrary number, and you never tracked any of the stuff that was, that was, uh, that, was uh, caught, that you used out of that money. Now, what I, uh, and then never, never provide a precise estimate in your proposal. Now, what I use is a change budget, but I'll talk about that when I talk about the change procedure, which is different than a pad, and I'll explain why. Okay, the next section, excuse me, I'm gonna take a little swig of water here. I'm getting a little, a little dry mouth. So, um, you need to define what your approach is to getting the right people involved, the right plugins involved, the right hosting involved, the right blocks involved, and then other resources that you're going to need. So, um, like for plugins, most people have a standard set of plugins that you like to use. You write up a description of those. You modify it based on the needs of the client. And so that deliverable is pretty much done before you ever start, right? You just have to tweak it each time for each client. Or be open-minded to a better plug-in coming along, because sometimes that does happen. <laughs> You want to switch. Um, let's see, what else did I want to tell you about this? I think that's it. Okay, then you got your wet work breakdown structure, so I put a picture of the waterfall here to indicate. <laughs> I use a waterfall approach, um, which all that means is that one phase, activity, or task leads into the next one and into the next one. The output of one becomes the input to the next. It also has milestones or breaking things down into chunks. 
the 80 hour rule that we talked about or something similar and um, a work breakdown structure that uses incremental approvals. Um, if you can get your client to approve the design in little pieces, then when you get to the end of the project, there's nothing hardly left to approve because they approved everything in pieces. You know, that last section where they have to approve the entire website can sometimes drag your project to a screeching halt. But if you've got good acceptance criteria defined up front and then you use this incremental approval process, it can really make things so much nicer at the end so that you all go have champagne together instead of going, well, I'm glad that's over. <laughs> and then which approach to content collection are you going to take? The, which came first, the, con the chicken or the egg, the content? Mm -hmm or the design. Most people talk about um, a content first design approach, but I think it goes deeper than that. I think it is a content first development approach. Now when I say I, get, I don't do any development until the client gets me the content, I don't mean that I don't do a stitch of work. <laughs> I do some preparation, I set up, and, and I will, I will um, install some plugins, especially if it's say a forms plugin or something where I'm going to need to create a form to get them to approve. Um, when I'm doing the design, then yeah, I'll go ahead and set those things up first. But in terms of doing any real design without having done uh, them, and, and here's the other thing. When you, if you do the content first stuff right, and you do a ra ra random order of magnitude of the content before you ever start, like how many paragraphs are going to be on each, first you do your site map, figure out how, what the pages are, then you figure out, well, how much content, how, many text, how much text is going to be on that page, probably, how many videos, how many pictures, how many, you know, whatever, and you show that to the client, they will most, if they were planning to do the content and you don't really want them to because you know it's going to slow things down, that will usually convince them that it's too much work for them, that they need to get a third party, or if you offer that service, that you need to hire them to do, hire you to do it. It's a good selling point sometimes when you show them what it really looks like in little bits and pieces. Okay, so you, in, this, in this approach to your content collection, you need to define how you're going to determine the content requirements. And here's the other thing. A lot of times the, the approach we take is, Okay, well, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna figure out how many pages we need and everything, and I'm gonna figure out how much. And I'm then you go and you know what content needs to be on the pages, so you go go get it. But we don't ever really uh, devise the requirements for the content, and we don't ever estimate the content if we're not the ones doing the work. But I contend that it's our job to to estimate the whole project, even if the client's doing that big chunk, so that they get a real good sense of what that means. And that's a lot of the problem with getting the content from the client is they don't understand the magnitude of the work. Yes, sir, you have a question? How often do you deal with a client where the actual content is coming from a third party, like a copywriter, uh -huh. and then you have to motivate the because they're not worried about the content, they're worried Oh, and I try never to have the copywriter contracted to the client. The copywriter should be contracted to you. Going, I mean, that's just how I've always done it because for that exact reason. It, and you just build that into the cost of the project once you get the client to agree to it. And that way you get to work with the copywriter you like and that y'all work well together and that sort of thing. It lets you vet that. And, and that's the way you sell it to them is, look, I already got a copywriter that can do this for you. You don't need to go hire anybody if that's the way you want to go. And your content collection approach needs to set the proper expectations with the client regarding content, the magnitude of the work, who's going to do what, and that sort of thing. Um, and then uh, you, in this, you got to describe how you're going to manage those content collection activities, whether you're going to do the content first approach and what your, what your expectations are from the client. Change management. Okay, we tend to pretend like, well, you know, if we're really good at what we do, there will be no change. That's just dumb. There is going to be change on every project. I don't care how small. I don't care how. Look, I am a fabulous business analyst. I can do the best business requirements and functional requirements you've ever seen. But I've never had one project where there wasn't something that slipped through the cracks that showed up later. So acknowledge change as inevitable with the client. Just be brutally honest with them. Say, look, this is what happens on almost all projects, but I've got a process in place that's going to prevent that. So, and that means that you plan for change, you manage the change, you use a change budget, which I'll explain in a second, and you implement change control, these last two words, without exception, no matter how small, no matter how whatever. Okay, so um, the change budget. $5,000 project, 
I'm going to take 20 to 30 percent of that, add it to it as a change budget. And then when I present my proposal to the client, I'm going to say, look, this, this bucket is sitting over here for you to use for changes that might occur. Doesn't matter who comes up with the change or whose fault it was that it wasn't discovered earlier. None of that matters. We're taking all the negativity out of it. But that then when, some, when a change comes up, you, feel, you do the change request, somebody decides how much impact it's going to have on the cost, how much impact it's going to have on the schedule, and then the client gets to decide, do I want to take that money out and put it in the budget? And if they say yes, go ahead and make the change, boom, invoice. <laughs> that way I make sure I get paid for every single change. Now that's not true. I don't always invoice them right immediately. Sometimes I'll wait to the next payment interval and I'll just add it to that payment interval that they were going to make anyway. But the point is, don't do work without getting paid just to be nice because they'll expect it the next time and the next time and the next time. I've done it. I know. It's terrible. And then we just talked, we talked about acceptance management and you need a formal process of acceptance. And by that, I don't, it just needs to be a process everybody can follow. That's what formal means. Um, it needs to be incremental, as I mentioned, and you need to define what the acceptance criteria is before the project begins. So why does any of this matter? Well, let's be honest, guys. WordPress is not that hard. And, uh, you know, one WordPress solution for an easy mom and pop website is generally going to look pretty much the same as the next guy, right? It's going to have a theme. It's going to have some plugins. It's going to have design elements, maybe some custom CSS, maybe a little coding. But you need something else to do, that, you can set, that you can set yourself up as a unique value proposition. So what are you, how are you going to do that? Well, if you use a two-step proposal process like mine, it actually ends up saving money. Because if during the, you give, remember you gave them a range in the proposal? And then during the deep dive is when you get into the detail. Well, if a change comes up during that process and that does not cause you to exceed the range that you gave them in the first place, no change control. You don't need to. It's part of the discovery process. They're with you every step of the way, so they never balk on anything because they were right there when the change was discovered. So doing, if you do changes during that phase where you're doing the project definition, zero dollars. You do it during development, big dollars. So it costs a lot more to do changes later on. So this is how you set that up. If you can set, if you've got a way to do this, then you say to your client, you know, this is what makes me better than the next guy. We don't estimate what we don't net know. If you can tell your client, we don't pad estimates because we don't have to, and you show them how you did it, and then the next guy, he's going to say to the next guy, how'd you come up with that estimate? <laughs> he's going to be a little more educated. We ensure we get the right resources involved. Um, you explain to him what your process is. You know, I've got this copywriter on that's in the background here if we need them. I have this standard set of plugins. These are, these are you know, plugins that are well respected. And, you know, you don't want to go into too much technical detail, but you get my point, right? Um, is you're just explaining to them the process by which you're coming up with this. Um, then you do this, uh, the incremental acceptance process that avoids misunderstanding because um, and here I'm showing it as requirements. You got an approval on, then you got approval on the content, then you got approval on the plugins, you got approval on the layout and branding. Then when you get done, where well, you've put it all together, what are they going to argue about? Nothing, because it's all just if you've already gotten it approved, unless there's a change. We design around content, which increases efficiency. Um, when you discover additional content needs once you're in development, often that will affect the design. And then you just got a boatload of rework, which is, you know, the, the um, quintessential scope creep. So that's why we do the content first. That way we make sure our design is, in, is uh, headed in the right direction. And we acknowledge change. We plan for it. We let you manage it. And this is something I wish everybody would, would start doing is stop penalizing the client for change as if it's their fault. It's nobody's fault that this change occurred or that they've decided now that they need this new feature. Or they, I mean, sometimes they're frivolous, but the thing about that change budget is you get a lot fewer frivolous change requests because it's their money, right? They're not asking you to take the money out of your ROI. It's coming out of their change budget. They're a lot less, you know, if they say, well, we want all that. Remember when I told you I wanted all those things red? Now I want them blue. You know, if there's not a business requirement behind that, you can usually talk the client out of it. Um, by saying, you know, you're going to have to take money out of the change budget. Oh, you know the other beauty thing about the change budget? It's magic. You always come in under budget. 
Because <laughs> you don't use the change budget. Nobody, you hardly ever, if you, if you do that percentage correctly, you hardly ever use the change budget. And then that, again, the thing about estimating is the only way to get better at it is to keep doing it. You know, and measuring yourself and figuring out where you made your mistakes and then improving. Yes? So with the change budget, you don't actually include that in your total estimate. You actually say my estimate is $3,000, my change budget is $500. They pay, uh, you set the schedule of payment for the $3,000, mm -hmm. and then... And, and so this is just over here. They haven't paid for it yet, am I right? Correct. And so in that utopia world where you would have no changes, you'd never touch that budget, and it's never real money. It's just a budget. Okay. You know, but they they're, but, they but know it's possible. It's possible, that, it's possible that project could cost $3,500, or even more if they exceed their change budget, but I've never had that happen, okay. as long as you put enough aside to begin with. Um, so we never penalize the client for change. It's not their fault. They don't, they don't you know, and see, because they don't know how we do business, and we forget to educate them on what is, it, what is involved in a website project. Yes? Have you tried actually taking the money um, up front with the bucket money? No, the question was, have I ever tried to take the change budget up front? Yeah. No. No, but that could be a good incentive for getting the content done on time. And now I, I got five minutes? Ten. Thank you. Oh, that's what two fives mean. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm close to being finished. Okay. Um, yeah, we just got to stop making the client feel bad for coming up with changes. And then you can always position it as a phase two item, too. First, you evaluate the change through the change control process, and they go, that's going to take six more weeks? You know, and they don't want to, They don't want the time extended, so that so you just suggest that it go into a phase two, and we'll we'll do that in another project, and then you do go through the whole process of estimating the project again. The other way you can incent your client to get you content on time is and this this in this case a little pad's okay. Maybe you add five hundred to the total, and then you tell the client you will give them a five hundred dollar rebate if they get all their content done on time. The main thing is to make sure the client understands how big that job is and are they really prepared to do it. And, if, and that's your job to help them figure that out. Maybe they are. Maybe they're not. Maybe you're not. Maybe you need to get that third party. Okay, so how does this set you apart? All right, the other guy is not really a shark. I just really liked that picture. <laughs> but this is how it sets you apart from the other guy. You have a two-step estimating and proposal process if you were to copy what I do estimating an approval process. The other guy just attempts a precise estimate without a deep dive or, or detailed stuff because he's doing that crystal ball thing. Um, the functions actually do, the, end up function, the ending functions actually do address the business requirements, which is a big <coughs> deal. The functions, can, and, and when the other guy does it, the functions can't always be tied back to a business requirement because they just, well, we always do that because that's the way we know all our clients like that. You know, that's not a requirement. The client didn't ask for it. Um, content first. Um, on the other guy, it's usually content bottlenecks and project delays. Um, manage change with, a cl with the client in charge. He has no plan for managing change. Use a change budget. Um, pads the quote to cover any unknowns. And I'll have a link to these slides I'll give you in a minute. This, they're on my website. Um, precise acceptance criteria doesn't precisely define what done means, and that's not just for the final project, but for each little piece. And then you, uh, you use proven, product, product, blah, blah, blah. proven productivity management techniques that may allow you to get your projects done on time within budget and with features that meet the client's needs. And he doesn't. Okay, so here's the kicker of once you've convinced the client that you're like the project manager from heaven, um, then you educate them on what to ask the other guy, okay, which is what's really going to set you ahead of the game. How did you arrive at that estimate? You want your guy to go ask that guy, how did you arrive at the estimate? How do you discover and document the business requirements? What's your process for that? How do you manage the content activities? How do you plan for and manage changes? How is the cost for change determined? What are the criteria for approval of the project? What about interim deliverables? And how can we be sure that the project will be completed on time within budget and has all the features we requested? When you school your client to ask those questions of the next guy and the next guy can't answer them, guess what? You just won. So the key, in summary, 
is to try to become a WordPress triple threat. Be a good designer, be a good developer slash implementer, and be a good project manager. And so you're going to do that with requirements discovery, content activities, change requests, and scope creep, deliverable approvals, estimates and timelines, client expectations and training. So in summary, you should be like this, not like this. <laughs> um, if you want some more training information on different pieces and parts of this, I have three freebies on my website. Um, one is a tip sheet on six ways to control scope creep in your, pro in your proposal. I have the free lesson that's part of the content collection roadmap. And then there's a little mini training on those six principles I was telling you about. Now, that mini training uses a different name. I was calling them the six principles of WordPress productivity. And then I realized I can't use WordPress in that manner. It had to be for WordPress from, you know, the trademark thing. And then two other things is I am the, I do administer the Facebook project management group on Facebook. It, um, I'm trying to get people more engaged, but I do post some lives and some information there. And the people that are in my group are going to get special discounts as we move forward. And I'm creating some more stuff that I, that I would love to tell you about, but I'm not allowed to tell from the stage. Okay, so, um, no, I'll tell you about later. Um, it, they're, they're not, it's not ready anyway. But it's a lot of, a lot of pieces and parts of this that will help you get that job done. Um, the other thing is the admin bar. Um, Facebook group, which I am only a member of, but I am in love with these guys. They, they really, um, Adam's been interviewed by the admin bar, right? Yes. Um, they, uh, they're very laid back and they're focusing, they're, both of them came out of different other industries. One was graphic designer, can't remember what Matt was, but um, they came together and, and they do this, uh, they do a podcast live in the Facebook group and there's a lot of engagement there, a lot of people helping people with um, more the, of the business side of, you know, what tool do you use for that? Because listen, a project management tool is never going to solve this problem for you, okay? <laughs> it, it'll help you rock, p plug everything into the little boxes, but it's not going to solve the problem. So they go over a lot of that stuff about which tool to use for this and, you know, how do you do a funnel if you, how do you do a funnel if you actually are a, a you know, a software developer or, or a WordPress agency. So I highly recommend both those things. Um, my slides are available at wproadmaps.com forward slash WordCamp. Um, the, and I am at WP Roadmaps just about everywhere. And I would love some social media love if you liked what you heard here today. And then if you want to skip all those freebies, but you want to know about this big thing I got coming out soon, that's probably going to help you a lot, then you can just text Roadmaps to 444-999, and you'll be on my email list instantly. Ta-da! <laughs> I guess I should put that back up there. So did you find that helpful? Does anybody have any questions? Yes. So I started also with Agile development. I'm very familiar with this. I'm trying to transition over to WordPress, but I'm noticing some of the clients are used to uh, quick hits, freelancers from Upwork, being able to work really quick. But I'm trying to get them to sit down for a deep dive requirements hour to and then charge them on top of that they don't take very kindly to that do you have any suggestions on well, that's why if you make it as part of the as you make if you make it as the first activity and your deposit covers that activity so they don't feel like they're paying for it. And then at the, at the end of that deep dive, if what you if the new estimate that you come out with at the end of the deep dive exceeds the first one, you just hand them the statement of work and say, go get the guy at Upwork to do it. I don't care. <laughs> That's part of the deposit. Sometimes my deposits are more than 50%. If it's a big, complicated thing, like when I, had to, when I had to take a Weebly site and an old WordPress site and put them together and then add membership functionality and blah, 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 blah. I mean, it just went on and on and on. That one, I got a big deposit up front because I knew that discovery was going to take us a long time. Yes? I usually use 20 to 30%. Sometimes it depends on the client. You know, sometimes you just got to be kind of intuitive. Well, you got to be intuitive about... All right, they're never going to get this done. I'm, I'm making it 40%, <laughs> you know. Or this is somebody you've worked with before. You know they're easy. You know you can you know, you've worked with them. So you say oh, I'm just going to put 20% over there. It really doesn't matter because if it, if you exceed if you exceed it, then you have a meeting with the client and you show them why it was exceeded and we need to replenish it as we go forward.
Well, no, changing a word, that's not exactly what I mean. But any change that's going to change the timeline, the cost, or the resources. Even if changing a resource doesn't change the time or cost, it's still a change that needs to be documented. And you know, I'm a big believer in the project notebook, too. You do one for each one, then you, before you do the next project, you go back to your project notebook, and you're like, oh, yeah, remember when that happened? Look, we can't remember stuff. I can't remember what I had for dinner last night. So, you know, trying to remember the last time I worked for this client or what did we write down six weeks ago, that's why that project notebook is such a good resource. Could you treat bugs differently? I'm, I'm sorry? Bugs? Oh, yeah, bugs are your fault. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes? You mentioned the 80-hour rule. Uh -huh. What is that? Oh, the 80-hour rule is like an Agile sprint. Are you familiar with Agile? A little bit, yeah, okay. So all that means is that you have a deliverable every 80 hours. Okay. Or that was what we did in software development, but, but the project was going to last a year and a half, okay? So in your case, you might say, okay, I'm going to do it, um, you know, uh, at different intervals in your project plan, but you have a deliverable, there's a sign-off, everybody, and then that feeds into the next section, and you know that's already approved, right? Okay. So that's why we have that 80-hour rule, because you never get off more than two weeks if you use 80 hours. Or two, you know, two weeks of man hours. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. My pleasure. Yes. Here's what I suggest: join the admin bar Facebook group. Those are exactly the kind of things they talk about on the on the business side. Um, of what the different tools they use. And uh, not just those two guys, but the people in the group really contribute. Um, Adam's a member. Troy Dean's a member. You're a member. Everybody's a member. Any other questions? He's saying, zero time. I am done. <laughs> but I'll be outside if anybody wants to ask any more questions. I'm happy to talk to you. I love talking about this stuff. I'm such a geek.